All right, now this is a video that I really never wanted to do because it gets a little too complex and it's very hard to do an overview of this subject without getting off into the weeds. I mean, any one of the different uh, subject matters contained within you could write a book on. But anyway, I just feel I need to flush out what I had in the last video just a little bit and I'm not going to let it get too complex. I just simply don't see it as my place to do so and uh, I really don't have the time. You know, because really all this stuff is is about thermodynamics. You know, I don't care if it's a diesel or a gas engine or a two-stroke or a four-stroke. It's really about burning fuel, creating heat, expanding gases to push things around. And that's what an internal combustion engine is about. And on these two strokes right here, they may be very, very mechanically simple, but they're actually very complex. So concept number one is these things are pumps. Both four strokes and two strokes are effectively pumps. And they're pumps that are effectively self-powered because of expanding gases that are burned within. The way to get more power in all of them is to get more molecules of the gasoline and air mix and then uh, burning it efficiently and then using the expanded gases to push things around. Now a four stroke the top end of the motor is to pump effectively because you got your valves, the piston goes down and as the volume increases obviously the pressure drops a valve opens and and the air rushes in and mixed with fuel gets to the bottom the valve closes, the piston goes up and compresses that, and there's a point of diminishing returns, by the way, with how much you want to compress that mix. And then a spark plug goes pop, the uh, fuel air mix burns, and it expands and uh, pushes that piston back down, which turns a crank, obviously, and you start generating rotational energy or power. and uh, when it's done expanding and it's expended as much of the energy as, as possible um, in pushing that piston down, the flywheel weight of the motor continues that crankshaft to turn and pushes the piston back up, another valve opens and it expels that exhausted gas. Now, be it four stroke or two stroke, there's a couple things you got to think about. Obviously the more gas air mix you can have up there to go pop the more power you're gonna make right but also when you have enough compression uh, there's sort of like this sweet spot to where you're not gonna make it self combust too much compression you have a diesel right too little compression you have a motor that won't run and there's a sweet spot to where you can compress that gas air mix that when the spark plug goes snap and starts burning that thing it'll burn efficiently, nothing's ever 100%, expand efficiently, and of course you're losing heat through the wall of the uh, cylinder, which means that's energy that's not being turned into rotational motion, which is another little detail. Like I said, you can just get into the weeds on this stuff. Um, there was a certain amount of energy available with that gas air mix. I mean, if you burned it 100%, there's only X amount of energy available, right? And some of that energy is used to push the piston down because of the gas is expanding. Some of that energy goes away in terms of heat going out the walls of that container, that variable volume container, which is your cylinder. And, of course, you don't drop that temperature to zero with those gases, and there's uh, some more heat that goes out in the exhaust, and, uh, and some percentage of that combustion process gets turned into rotational motion, some gets turned into heat, some just gets blown out the exhaust, you know, in terms of heat as well, so it's, that's, that really determines the, the efficiency. The thermodynamic game is obviously to try to uh, create as much heat as possible and convert as much of that heat into a rotational uh, power as possible, right? And there's going to be the losses, as we described, because of heat transfer out of the vessel, um, just 
the friction within the motor and how much heat goes out the exhaust just because the gases didn't drop the temperature all the way to zero. All those things add up. You might be lucky to get 40% efficient taking all the heat that was generated and, turn, and turning that into a rotational uh, force. So that's the pump. Uh, that's the game of trying to convert gas air into useful uh, power, you know, and there's efficiencies based on all those things, heat transfer and all that stuff. The game that these guys play is trying to get enough of that gas air mix um, to produce the power they need based on the efficiencies of their design. And where the fork in the road is, in my mind, is, is, uh, is where that little two-stroke is going to be used. It might be one that's being used on a on a model airplane. It might be one being used in a chainsaw. It might be one being used uh, for a, a motorcycle. They're all different. And the two-stroke, the subject of our interest, is not like a four-stroke. It doesn't have that more defined pumping action with the valves. Basically, it's a, it's a completely different design. It's very clever. The pump isn't in the top end, it's basically the bottom end, and that's kind of the secret of them, is rather than using the piston to increase the volume and have a valve with the mixture in and then decrease the volume to have a valve push it out to pump the gas air mix into that device, basically it's the bottom end that's doing that. The piston going up creating a, uh, a larger volume in the bottom end, and, and that larger volume drops pressure and then your intake lets uh, the air go rushing in from atmospheric pressure right and then when the piston goes down um, and the two strokes we're dealing with on chainsaws obviously uh, the port timing is such that when the volume decreases again it pushes that gas air mix up to the top so just like a four stroke a two stroke is about trying to move gas air mix from somewhere else which is outside the motor through a carburetor to pick up fuel and then up into the combustion chamber to where it can be converted to heat which then with the expanding gases uh, tries to push the piston down to turn the motor around. Of course the losses are the same. Heat goes out into the cooling system, in our case fins, and then some of it goes out the exhaust. So I can get into the weeds on the efficiency and compression and stuff like that. Let's just, just assume we're not going to mess around with talking about what the optimum pressure is for the burn. Okay, That's what compression is about. Let's just talk about the mechanics of moving that gas air mix through the motor in this particular uh, video because it just goes off to the weeds like I said over and over. Uh, I'm going to leave the compression discussion uh, by saying that there is, there is a sweet spot of how much pressure you have in that uh, gas air mix to when you burn it you're going to have an efficient burn. And other things matter like the shape of the combustion chamber um, how that pushes on the piston. That's what the shape of the combustion chamber and the switch band is all about. Another discussion. I've had that a thousand times, so I'm going to leave that one alone. We're going to talk just simply about the pump and how the exhaust uh, system interacts with that pump. That's what we're going to talk about today. Keep it simple. Otherwise, it would be hours and hours and hours. So, the two-stroke is a pump, just like the four-stroke. But instead of using the top and in valves, it's using a combination of uh, opening and closing holes at the right time and the bottom end of that motor to move the gas air mix from the outside to the inside, right? And th there's, a, there's sort of a fork in the road for the designers. And it comes down to simply this, whether you have space or you don't. The motorcycle guys, they have space. The chainsaw guys, they really don't. A model airplane really doesn't, you know what I'm saying? Um, because a motorcycle, a, a snowmobile, an outboard, things like that, they have more space to work with. That means they can do things like, uh, well, add expansion chambers. And that really is something to assist the pump more than anything else. Where, And they can have a larger air box, they can have a larger intake. They have more space to come up with devices to help um, both move the gas air mix through the motor, but also uh, more space to get things efficient, get the bore and stroke right, stuff like that. They can just simply make a bigger device. And so that's those guys. 
the chainsaw guys, on the other hand, they don't have that space. So they need to get adequate power in a package that's small enough to compete in the marketplace in the given displacement and power class that they're shooting for, whether it be 60 cc, 70, 80, 90, whatever it is. And so they 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 have they they have constraints. And um, fact of the matter is both the motorcycle designers and the chainsaw model airplane RC type people have been able to produce adequate power in the space that's been allotted to them. Of course, we spend an awful lot of time talking about more power in a lighter package and stuff like that. And that really begins to move into the subject that I want to get into today. And that's the different exhaust uh, systems and just a very, very simplistic overview of how they work. The point I want to make is there's often a lot of discussion about well, geez, we did this back in the motorcycle years, and the motorcycle motors had these kind of ports and that kind of cylinder head and this kind of squish and all that stuff and that kind of port timing. Really, that doesn't translate to the simple two strokes we have in the chainsaws because those motorcycle designs have these expansion chambers. And really what that's about, let me roll back a little bit. Uh, all these two strokes, actually all the, these motors, you're dealing with a, uh, a compressible fluid. Air is like a big spring. So when you have like a tube full of air and you push it and then you stop it and then you pull it and then you push it, basically you putting these pressure waves up and down that column of air and that air compresses and then it expands and then it compresses and it expands and there's a lead lag to that process. Well, when I talk about the two strokes and the four strokes, the flow into those things is pulsed. And what I mean by that is you have these columns of air or volumes of air that are expanding, being contracted through the change in volumes or being moved through tubular or, you know, uh, pores. And they're columns of air that are expanding and then they come to a stop. They have to be uh, compressed and then they have like a spring effect where they get expanded again. And that's also based on how much heat's been introduced along the way. So that's what I mean by pulsed flow. You don't have an incompressible fluid like water. So the, the flow of the gases through these motors is not like absolute. It's not like when you shut off the valve, everything comes to a stop. And when you open a valve, it all starts. When you shut off a valve on, say, a transfer port, uh, there's still momentum from the back trying to push air into that thing. And it compresses a little bit when it opens that pops out on the other side. Actually, it's more like the intake than the transfers, and we'll explain that. So, you got to understand that. So, when we talk about this in a simplistic way, it's almost like we're talking about these things as if you have an incompressible fluid, and the opening and closing of the valves are like absolute, and they are not. Um, but I'm going to talk about it as if it's a incompressible fluid, just to keep it simple now. We'll talk about the uh, compressible nature at another point in time when I have the energy. So the expansion chamber motors, they're all different. They're designed all different. And the reason why is because instead of just having the bottom end uh, be the pump that moves the gas-air mix from the outside of the motor into the, uh, the crankcase by expanding the volume and then shrinking the volume and pushing it to the top to a place where it can be burned, you have this thing right here called an expansion chamber which aids that pump. And the way it works is this, and this is where it's going to start getting into the exhaust, is like we were saying before, you get a volume of gas air mix in the top end of that motor and it's compressed to a point where it can be efficiently burned. You know, combination of compression ratio where the switch band is moving it into a place where it can be burned. Spark plug goes pop the burn creates heat, the gases now expand, push back on that piston, and uh, it takes time, that's, that's where timing comes into play. It takes time for that burn to progress from where the spark plug lights it off to it propagating through the mix. Timing the motor properly means you got that flame front running down towards the piston, the piston comes up to the top, you want the flame front to hit that piston just as it gets uh, to top dead center, start pushing it down the other side. And that's where timing is. But I'm not going to get off into those weeds. But that, the gas air mix 
is expanding because it's burning and there's heat and what happens is based on PV is equal to NRT you add heat and it wants to increase its, its space, it wants to increase in volume and that starts pushing the piston down. When that piston gets to the top of the exhaust port now there's a place for it to go, it starts rushing out the pipe. The piston's still going down and now you start having this increasingly open hole for that pressure to escape and what the expansion chamber does, it plays a game in physics again, you have an increasing diameter or a cone. Well, basically it creates a vacuum and starts pulling uh, from the inside of that, that combustion chamber. So basically the expansion chamber is time to pull, 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 pull as that piston's moving down. There's a point where that piston's sort of close to bottom dead center and just beginning to come back up where they leave a constant uh, diameter because the flow is the way they want. The pressure has dropped. It's it's pulling as much as it can out the the uh, the, the combustion chamber. And also now the transfer port's open. That vacuum is is drawing from the combustion chamber, but through any other open hole, like the transfers all the way down to the bottom end. And if there's any open uh, holes for the uh, intake, it's also drawn from the intake, which is why. Some of the motorcycles of the 70s would actually have a hole in the back of the piston because the expansion chamber pull was so great that they could just leave that open basically and it was going to keep pulling gas air mix into the bottom end which was going to help in the next cycle, right? Reed valves uh, made it where it didn't really matter if, if that intake was open too long because as soon as the pressure changed to, the, um, to go positive and start pushing it's going to close the reed valve. But anyway, this thing is drawing, 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 and that piston goes down, goes past bottom dead center, starts coming back up. And then uh, you want to have it drawing as, almost as long as you can. And remember, it's a compressible fluid, so it's like a spring. It's like, a, it's like you pulling a rubber band. And then all of a sudden, that piston shuts off the transfer. And now you just have the combustion chamber. And there's going to be a time it takes time for that pressure wave to move up and down that uh, pipe. It's basically at the speed of sound. And what they've done, is genius, is now they have the cone shrink, go from a larger diameter to a smaller diameter, and as soon as those sound waves, that bang, that pop, that high pressure wave hits that cone, it reflects back. And the idea is that that expansion chamber uh, drawing and the distance here is based on how much time it, it has to pull effectively. When you have that pressure wave bounce back, what they're trying to do is draw as much gas air mix as they can first into the combustion chamber, but all the way out into the exhaust. And then that very powerful uh, pressure wave comes back and stuffs it right back into the, the cylinder before that piston closes off the exhaust. Because it's a compressible fluid, you know, it's, it's kind of like a balloon. You hit the balloon and it, it takes time for that pressure wave to get from one end to the other. And it's not instantaneous. It's not the speed of light. Those, those pressure waves are moving up and down the length of that pipe. And it takes time to get from one end to the other. And so you're never going to have it 100%. But the idea is to get as much of the gas air mix into the, an area that can be affected by this device and then use that device to pack it back into the... A cylinder as much as possible and then now you have a larger number of molecules to um, or a, a larger amount of gas air mix to, to burn and which means you have more energy to play with and uh, now it creates heat and makes the gases expand and since there's more gas to expand that means it's going to push a little harder on that piston and you make more horsepower and then uh, the whole thing happens again now of course with the expansion chamber while that transfer port is open, it's drawing all the way through. That means that you have the ability of, of pulling more through the whole system. So that is an active part of the pump. The piston and the expansion chamber are w working together to actually move more uh, gas air mix, right? And then almost like a supercharger, that's allowing a larger amount of gas air mix to get up into this area and then packing it back into that cylinder so you can get you know, a more uh, powerful pop because it's just more molecules to work with. Well, you don't have that on a, on a chainsaw. So the whole design based on that pulsed flow, those, 
those uh, columns of air or volumes of air that are like spongy, springy things. Uh, which, by the way, that amount of uh, spring in that air changes with heat, <laughs> which is another whole discussion. When you start looking at the Husqvarna 500 series, you're going to start seeing how the engineers are actually using heat to their advantage on that with those transfers going up by the exhaust. But that's another whole game. And like I said, you can go off into the weeds of anything. Just talking about the math of the expansion chamber based on the RPMs, uh, the cross-sectional area of the ports, uh, exhaust and transfer, and all the volume in the bottom end and all that stuff, that's a book. So, because you have these power adders on these two strokes that can sit in things like motorcycles and snowmobiles, you can optimize the rest of that two stroke design to take advantage of that big sucking pipe on there, you know what I'm saying? And everything from bore and stroke is going to be different. You're going to want more case volume. Um, the size of the ports, the port timing, all that stuff is going to be dependent on what this device here does. And of course that's also um, in concert with the designed horsepower that that mechanical device can handle the bearings and the case stiffness and all that and these engineers they come up with a target horsepower target rpm and they design the rest of this stuff to match that that uh, performance envelope defined by the package they're trying to build and sell this is not a chainsaw that if you just think about that in the most simplistic of terms a lot of the things you saw on those style of two strokes are there because of these power adders. And if you don't have them, they're not going to help you. So you can have a huge amount of transfer area, which works really good with a, uh, an expansion chamber like a motorcycle has. And um, the, the case design, the intake design, and all that. But if you don't have that thing to, to suck hard, to pull hard at the right time, all that stuff is a waste. It's not helping you. Now, the chainsaw guys, they have something different. They don't have the space to have these things. They just simply have a very simple uh, piston that goes up and down. And instead of having a combination of the crankcase and the uh, expansion chamber being the pump, the only thing they have for a pump is the crankcase. That's it. So now their designs can be all different. Now they're going to maximize the ability of just that piston going up and down changing the volume in the bottom end to both draw the mix in and then also to push it up through uh, the transfers. So bore and stroke really has a lot to do with that. And if you look at the Husky designs, you can see how that has evolved over time. When you look at like the 272s, you know, it's a 70cc class saw and they had, uh, you know, like a 52 millimeter uh, piston. And it's, it's a balance because the hydraulics of having a larger diameter piston, it's kind of like a hydraulic cylinder. If you have a larger diameter, you know, with a certain amount of pressure, it's, it's, it's that pressure over the area, you end up with, with a little bit of force or more force. You have less diameter on the hydraulics of a, of a hydraulic ram. Same amount of pressure, uh, you don't quite have as much force. It's always this balance between the diameter of the piston and uh, the rod ratios and things like that in order to get the kind of power or the kind of torque or the kind of uh, power characteristics that the designer is, is looking for. It's all a mix of things. It's all a compromise. But what I found is when you look at the history of the Husqvarna's, uh, as time goes on, they've put more and more emphasis on the pumping of the bottom end than, than the shape of the bottom end, the rod ratios. And they've gone from the larger diameter, shorter stroke, to a, a little bit less diameter in the piston on the same displacement saw, a little bit more stroke, and what that means to me is they're prioritizing the pump versus the hydraulics of the piston. The rod ratios, the bore and stroke, all that stuff is as much about the pump as anything. And yeah, it does alter how the piston goes up and down. You know, at different points in the stroke, it's going to have different speeds, and that's all true. The angle of the rod relative to the crankshaft and all that. But really, of all those uh, factors, the biggest factor still is getting more energy up there to play with. Because ultimately, if you can't pump a lot of energy into the top end and burn it efficiently, you're just simply not going to make power. 
you can have the best hydraulics and the best uh, rod ratios in the world, but if you don't have any material up there to burn, well, it's not going to make any power. So it's a blend of those things which creates the horsepower. It's always a blend. I'll let that bore and stroke rod ratios discussion wait for another time. Suffice to say that it's still all about the pump. That ultimately is what's going to generate the ability of moving the gas-air mix or the number of molecules into a place that can be burnt. And since it doesn't have the power adders like an expansion chamber, it's all the pump on these little uh, two strokes. Now, the exhaust does matter. I mean, they do have some space. One of the points I want to make is like with the 500 series, you'll notice that they'll have a lean back uh, cylinder because they have more space to work with on the exhaust side. That's why they do it. And they've sacrificed. I mean, they've shrunk the air box and they've created issues with heat transfer into the air box. Because remember, when that burns, some of that energy goes off in heat and radiates in all different directions. And part of the design of a saw is trying to um, control where all that heat goes so it doesn't do bad things. And in the case of the first series of the 500s, like the early 550s and the early 562s, some of the heat was radiating down to the cases from the muffler, creating some issues, and some of the heat was radiating back into the air box and uh, boiling the gas, and that created some problems. But where I'm going with this, like I said, it's so easy to go off into the weeds on these, these subjects, is I just want to talk about the exhausts. So we went through the expansion chamber concept just a little bit, a little bit about the burning of gas-air mix in order to make power, right? And obviously the easiest way to make more horsepower is to burn more, and the easiest way to do that oftentimes is just increase the RPMs. Of course that brings up a whole new set of problems um, for another video or another time. I don't know if I have the time to get into the, that uh, concept of a power band where all those things work together efficiently at one particular range of RPMs, which is why it's called a power band, and then too fast, things go down, the efficiency goes down, the ability to pump reduces, the ability to get the gases out reduces, stuff like that. And that's even before you start talking about the limitations mechanically of things like crank and bearings. So obviously there's some limits to the RPMs, you can only go so fast. The other way of making more power is within a given RPM range is to make the burn more efficient, and that's pretty much what I've done for the last 20 years of saying, okay, I'm stuck with bore and stroke, I'm stuck with the exhaust type I have, um, how can I make that little system run more efficiently, which makes more horsepower? And uh, I also don't like to increase the RPMs because of the mechanical limitations of cranks and bearings and stuff like that. One of the easy ways of making these chainsaws run a little bit better through efficiency, obviously, is compression. And another easy way is through the muffler mods. And um, I want to discuss that just a little bit because what the chainsaws have, instead of having an expansion chamber because they don't have the space, they have something called a pressure can. And what a pressure can really is, is the device um, stuck onto the exhaust port where it's a volume, it's like a chamber. And yeah, there's a taper. When the piston comes down and opens the exhaust port, there's a lot of pressure in there. And that opens up a hole to let it rush into the uh, exhaust, into the pressure can. And of course, while it's going down, it's also building pressure in the bottom end of the motor. And then at some point in time, it goes a little further, opens up the transfers, and hopefully the pressure from the bottom is great enough to overcome what the residual pressure in the combustion chamber is, right? And continue to drive that material out into the exhaust. That's the hope. And you can tell that that timing is based on pressures, right? And then different RPMs and different amounts of heat, that timing will be, will be altered to, to optimize those different uh, conditions. At least that's what the engineers are supposed to do. So anyway, continuing on, the piston goes down, jams past the uh, transfers, pushes some material up to help flush out, that's called scavenge, the burnt material out of the cylinder and push it into the exhaust. Meanwhile, with the pressure can, hopefully there's a, a pressure drop in here to help pull the stuff out. And then at some point in time, that pressure can fills and the pressure in it begins to increase and that starts putting a back pressure into the cylinder. And done properly, done properly, the exhaust rushes out, begins to fill, 
meanwhile, the hole is letting that pressure drop. So it's hopefully timed that when that pressure fills, it now begins to put some back pressure into here. Most of that uh, combustion chamber has been scavenged, and most of the gases are, are at least close to or out the exhaust. And then the pressure building here uh, puts sort of like a, a sonic barrier, a sonic wall, based on pressure to keep things from moving further out into the exhaust. Well, that's the idea. Does it really work? Well, sometimes. And do they really care whether or not they get all that out? Well, the newer saws, uh, they were a little more interested in, in uh, how clean the exhaust was. So letting the exhaust, it might have some mix of, of gas, air mix, and oxygen still burn a little further, even if it's in the combustion chamber, eh, they'll take that loss. We as hot rodders, we don't like that at all. So we want as much of that clean fuel air mix to fill that uh, combustion chamber as possible. We don't mind it going out into the exhaust. We don't care because we're looking for maximum power. So we open up the hole and that happens to not let the pressure rise as high and it also drops quicker. So it, it allows the exhaust gases to come further out into the exhaust. Now it doesn't do what an expansion chamber does and pack it back in. It really is just like a sonic wall. It's what it is, like a barrier. That's all it is. No more, no less. Where it basically puts a little bit of a puff back because it, it fills rapidly. Now there's pressure and it stops the flow from rapidly coming out the exhaust at some point in time. Done right, like I said, you get a full fill in the cylinder. Now, what we do by altering the hole size is we do a couple things. One, it doesn't quite get to that pressure, right? We lower the pressure. And if you have a hole that's 100% of the, uh, um, the exhaust size, you get really almost no pressure. I mean, there'll be some, but there won't be very much at all. And uh, then what happens is really nothing to keep that fresh gas air mix just to keep rushing right out into the exhaust. And uh, we don't really care because, yeah, we lose a little bit of, of, uh, of fuel mileage possibly or fuel usage goes down a little bit, but we get more power and it makes better noises. We like it. But done right, done right, you can actually get a reasonable increase in power and not have a, a significant drop in the efficiency because you're not letting all that gas air mix go rushing out the exhaust. So sizing that hole matters. And for my part, you know, when it comes to modifying exhaust, is there's always a blend of, of any kind of thing when it comes to a saw mod. To me, a good modification is one that makes my life a little bit easier with that particular tool. And uh, too much noise, uh, I'm getting tired of noise. You know, um, I do care about fuel usage, so I'm not really ready to give up and just put a straight open exhaust or a bluey pipe. We'll get into that next. And... Um, Directing the, the exhaust away from my work is really important. And last but not least, I don't want to rock the saw and have my muffler turn into a, a bucking spike. So those things alter my priorities some. So I still come up with a pressure can concept and I usually try to get the pipe out the side. And yeah, I can sacrifice some things, but I'm gaining a saw that does run better, doesn't use a lot more fuel, sounds a little bit better because that is important. It doesn't blow the gas air into my work, and it doesn't turn into a bucking spike. So these are real simple. And, uh, but here's, here's one nuance to this style of exhaust and pretty much all the other open exhaust type systems. Now the piston goes up, bang, comes back down, uh, goes out. We understand that side of it. But what about when the piston's still going up, right? When, when that piston gets to bottom dead center, that's the maximum pressure possible. Now, I understand it's compressible fluid, so it's like a balloon. There's a little lag, a little delay, so things don't happen like instantaneously. So, so it's not like that piston goes down, and just because that's maximum pressure, you have instant speed at the gases that are out the uh, transfer. It takes time for that pressure wave to get there, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, not going to get into that now. That's another whole book. Piston goes down, maximizes the pressure in the bottom end. It's pushing as much of the fuel air mix from the bottom end into the top end as possible. And then it starts going back up, right? 
Now that's going to start increasing that volume again, so you're beginning to draw pressure. Now remember, it's, it's, there's a spring effect, so it doesn't immediately show at the transfer port that there's a volume of mix that has been compressed and is shooting up those transfer ports, and then just because the volume down here is expanding, it doesn't immediately change the velocity of that stuff significantly as, as the pistons begin to go back up. So you're still getting gas air coming up through the transfers, even though now the piston's coming back up to close it off. But here's the critical point, and this is also about the timing. When that piston gets to the top of the transfer port, shuts it off, that means no more is coming from the bottom to the top. And that little oscillation of pressures, that's a different discussion, right? But now there's a period of time when the piston has gotten to the top of the transfer, shuts off the flow, but there's still an open um, path out the exhaust because it hasn't quite got to the exhaust yet. Remember, you got the blowdown. And during that period of time, if the, if the um, pressure can is designed properly, that's when you get your little sonic dam somewhere out here where now that period of time, it doesn't let it just drop all the pressure in the cylinder here, and then basically you lose what you gain. Because remember, it's all about how many molecules you have up in there when you finally shut all the holes off, because the more you have, the more uh, mixture you have to burn, the more power you're going to get per pop. So that's the key, and that's the place where you got to think about when you have these open exhausts. Now that happens real quick, you know what I'm saying? When the time that that piston gets to the top of the transfer then jumps over to close off the exhaust, that's not very much time. So uh, that plays in our favor, but it is time. There is an amount of pressure loss in the cylinder out that exhaust during that period of time. That is a place where the, the newer exhausts that people are using uh, need to consider because you get into the higher uh, pressures that loss is greater. But also when you start getting larger blowdown numbers, I know as a guy who really likes those large blowdown numbers, the time at which that piston uh, closes off the transfer and then there's a, a, it has to span the distance to close off the exhaust is larger, which means there can be a greater pressure loss out that combustion chamber. Now at lower RPMs that matters, at higher RPMs it doesn't. For that matter, you need the, the blowdown for the higher RPMs. It's just something to consider, but the blowdown is a part of the equation when you have the pressure cans, and the pressure can really is just a very simple device. It's meant to blow up with air, you know, like you puffing up your cheeks, and then the, uh, the little hole doesn't let it get too high, but also bleeds it down at a certain rate. The idea, again, is to block the exhaust with a sonic dam before... Um, before the pressure drops too much in the cylinder, you lose some of what you gain. All right, moving on to Wooly Pipes.